I hope you all had a blast today. Uh, this is going to be the last talk. It's going to be a very practical one. Um, I do some basics, and later on, you're going to see some life hacking and some life code. So my talk is about bending UIKit to your will. Um, first, a little bit about me. I'm Peter Steinberger. You probably know me from my Twitter handle. Um, my day-to-day -day job is working on a PDF framework for iOS, which is used by all the big companies like Dropbox, Evernote, and a lot of banks. Um, by the way, I'm looking for some help on this. So if you're interested in, in working with me on a freelance basis or something like that, uh, go come to me after the talk. But back to the actual talk. So what do I mean with bending? Um, we all try to make the, the best possible applications, and we also don't want to reinvent the wheel. We really want to use uh, what Apple gives us. So I want you to consider uh, getting private API as one part of your developer's toolbox. My, my goal here is a little bit to de-stigmatize uh, private API calls. I know this is controversial, and there is lots of time after this talk uh, to talk with me in private about this. But first, let's do, let's do a small survey. Who of you ever used any private API? Yeah, I mean, if you're a developer, like every, all hands should go up. And who of you actually shipped apps with private API? Yeah, there are actually more hands than I expected. <laughs> so actually, this is some kind of open secret in the industry. I just spoke to someone who worked at Square, and even they are using private API, and we discussed how to best obfuscate it. Um, sometimes you simply have some edge cases where you're not getting along any otherwise. Um, my, my big disclaimer, uh, private API is the programmer's equivalent of explosive material. Even the, that quote is even from Gruber, so even he knows about that. Um, but there are still a lot of times when it's okay to call private API. For example, if you do an enterprise app and you have control about the environment, it is perfectly okay to probably take some shortcuts or do things that work better with that specific calls if you really know what you're doing. Um, it is also very okay to use private API during development. Um, the first example, which hopefully everybody knows about, is recursive description. Um, this, is, this is really my bread and butter. I, I use this like multiple times every day. I even go the extra round and make empty subclasses of certain views, so simply that my recursive description tree looks correct. So if you don't know that this is on UI view, and I call it on the window, which is a UI view as well, and then you get a nice tree of all the views in your hierarchy with the frame and uh, a few metadata. And if you search the internet on my blog, you find a blog post about pimping UI description, uh, pimping recursive description. So for example, there are certain classes uh, that you might be interested in. For example, you often have a, a UI view in the hierarchy, which is actually the view from a UI view controller. And with a few runtime tricks, you can actually print that UI view controller so you see if this view is single or this view is actually managed by a controller. Uh, this again uses private API. It is an underscore view delegate because the controller becomes the view delegate. But again, because this is only really used for development and only helping me while I make an app, it is perfectly okay to do so. So another very useful uh, call is manually performing a memory warning. I know everybody, everybody probably did this uh, and used this debug menu in the simulator and called once in a while a memory warning on the simulator. But we all not doing this often enough. And I, I have like a lot, I got a lot of crashes that only happened on the device because there you can get the memory warning at any time. So in my later, in my later work, I added a timer that simply selects a random time and then calls this perform memory warning and then restarts itself for another random time. So you kind of get like memory warnings on the simulator as well at, at random times. And this really helps shifting some of the bugs that you get at your customer to bugs that you get during development. I mean, this, this was crazy important back on iOS 5 where views could still be unloaded. It is still important on iOS 6 because uh, you still should have some code 
that, that cleans itself up when there is a memory warning. Another um, probably a little bit more obscure one, but still very useful call is ChPass print. If you ever done a, a shadow pass that is a little bit more complex than a rect, uh, and then you probably tried making a description on the CG pass, and all you get is CG pass memory address, uh, not like 100 points. You could, you could write it your own. I know Ole Bigeman is somewhere in there, and he actually wrote, uh, wrote code that, that prints it out. And I say, I only need it during development. I really don't want the user show my points as strings. I really want to show him the shadow pass. So it's perfectly OK to use this during development. Note that this is a C function, so you actually have to declare it somewhere in a header, and then you can call it. And you have to make absolutely sure that this gets removed before you push it to the App Store, because this will get you rejected. Another, another one, I really, I really love that one. It is, it is one of those tiny details that I simply love during development. I call it um, PSPDF simulator animation drag coefficient. Um, you all know this feature on the simulator where you uh, go to the debug menu and then you toggle slow animations. And then you can debug your animations and you see everything super slow. But then you have some core animation animations and boom, they're gone. They don't care. They don't care what you're setting on this, on this, slow, uh, on this slow setting. They, they look really out of place. And you can call this method and simply multiply it every time you do a core animation animation, and this will probably most of the time return 1. But when the, the debug setting is enabled, it might return 10 or 5. I actually never looked what it really returns, but some multiplier. And then both animations, both the UI kit ones and the core animation font perfectly match up. And this is just very helpful for debugging. Now, this code is a little bit simplified. Um, you actually should dispatch once it and save the memory address. I do a little bit more crazy things here and use DL open and DL sim, which is the dynamic link loading. And we actually dynamically open UIKit, uh, getting the bundle and the file pass where UIKit is. But since it's already loaded, it simply gives us a memory address. And then we ask the DL sim, give us the address for the U animation drag coefficient. And it will give us the, the memory pointer to that function or nil. So if you do it right, this is actually something that could be shippable in the App Store. I mean, not with this example, because this, again, is really only useful during development. But this would not crash if Apple some point, at some point re uh, removes that function. This would work. By the way, I have to credit Cedric Lucy uh, on the actual idea on your animation drag coefficient. I, I would never have known. Um, then, there is, then there is one last thing in my small toolbox uh, that is really interesting and that you should all simply copy and write once for your own apps, which is you can simply observe every notification there is. So I, I actually I kind of found it out by accident. Uh, but if you simply uh, you set nil on the add observer for name, you see all notifications there are on the system. And there are a crazy, crazy lot. And I actually used this for a specific feature where I had to know on iOS 5 when a user goes to full screen in a YouTube view. And you know, if you ever mess around with YouTube, it is a mess, and it changed a lot on iOS 6, but it's still a mess. But you really don't have control. You, you don't get notified when there is a full screen mode. But there is a notification, which is private. Um, but this really was the best solution instead of scraping your, uh, YouTube and building my own viewer. So another, another quite useful way where a private API is perfectly OK is testing. We already heard a little bit about this. There are a lot of testing frameworks out there, like Noxilla or Square's Pony Debugger. And they all use some or more private API. Some create a GS event to manually um, send touch events into the system. Some others use uh, NS HTTP URL response to mock HTTP requests, which would be quite hard if they wouldn't use private API. Since again, you only use it during development, it is perfectly OK to do so. Now, a topic that is very interesting for me, and that's actually the main reason for this talk, is fixing Apple's bugs. Uh, you all know when you have an Apple bug, uh, this is what you're going to do. 
you were the raider, a jury will haunt uh, you himself, and you hopefully also publish as an open raider. But then what? Uh, actually, I, I find a lot of raiders, and most of them are still open. Like, I don't even know if Apple read it. I mean, I sometimes tweet about it, and I might get some tweet from an Apple guy that says he's looking into it, but a lot of the times nothing happens, or it gets close as a duplicate, and you never know if the original bug got fixed or not. So pretty much a year ago, I was working hard to support this new UI page view controller, which we heard before is not great. Um, but my customers really wanted to have this page crawl, even though scrolling actually is more performant. Um, and I also have a bottom bar where you can slide your finger across. And if you do that, I change page, and I change pages a lot. So I'm really like pushing the, the page view controller to its limits with having like 20 transitions at the same time, which is supported. There is, there is no document that states uh, that this should not work. And then I spent about a week refining everything and making everything great. Uh, and then I finally tried this in a release build, and I got this. Actually, I got an excess bad exec, but then you know you turn on zombies, and then you get this. And it's telling me that some underscore UI page call class um, was there located and still called. So you look a bit desperate, and then you think about what you can do about it. So um, my guess is that Apple. Uh, forgot to nil out the delegate, so the current animation was still running, but they probably only ret retained one, and then the next animation got in. And if you're lucky, the animation completed before the auto release pool cleared itself, but if you, if you had bad luck, you got a crash. And that's not, sh that's not something that is shippable, even if it only happens when you really scrubble a lot. I mean, I could potentially block the UI and only show one transition, but I really wanted to have this great feature. So what do you do when you're really desperate? You think of, if I only could get grip on this object for a little longer, like, like half of a second or a second, just as long as the animation completes. Uh, and then I swizzled the airlock. And <laughs> I put on a small delay, and then I called the original dialog. And turned out, this, this worked fantastic. This is like <laughs> the, the best fix ever. <laughs> but you know. You know what's even worse than, than swizzling dialog? Swizzling dialog on NS object. You really, really, really don't want to do that. So somehow we have to get this underscore page call class. And you know, Apple is has kind of like a zero tolerance policy on on on, on private API. Yeah, you really want through, but then you just get a sad face. And um, if you play by the rules. I still had to wait for iOS 6 or 7 until the bug is fixed, and then I could ship this feature. Luckily, their detection is also very stupid. Uh, so even the, the cheapest possible way to obfuscate a string will, will get you through. So I actually, this is, this is no, no trick. This is actually shipping in a few hundred apps, including your Dropbox app that you have on the phone. Um, I mean, it's very possible that Apple, at some point, steps up in the game and does deep memory analyze, but there are still so much ways you could abuse the system. It's, it's always like it's impossible for them to catch it all. And, and the story continues. So actually, I spent about a week on it, and I, I did this horrible dialogue whistling hack, and I, I really felt terrible about it. And I ran it on Twitter a lot, and I, I told, like, I'm going to hunt down the, the engineer that wrote UI page for control and make it fix. And Oliver Gutknecht, who also works at uh, the UI kit, he's actually the guy that wrote UI collection view. So I know him a little bit because I wrote the PSD collection view, which is basically the same. Uh, and he wrote, yeah, we're going to protect him. Uh, and I was at WWDC 2012, and I found the UI page view controller guy, and Oliver was not there. <laughs> <laughs> and I made sure this is fixed on iOS 6. Yeah. So yeah, private API is also a lot of fun sometimes. It's just sometimes very nice to be evil. 
uh, it's nice to experiment with API that we probably might see on iOS 7 or not. Um, it's awesome to see hacks like the, the, the freed Facebook chat heads. It is interesting to see messages that were left by Apple engineers. We've already seen, he actually stole my slide. <laughs> uh, I, I tweeted about this and it turned out Evan Dahl. Evan Dahl who made the, the, the CS193 courses and worked at Apple and he's now the head of Flipboard. He actually wrote this way back then as a class on UI view controller, as a message on UI view controller, and it's still there. And there it gets even better because there's also Radar written by, by Craig Hockenberry. Uh, it's still open. And he asked for, he called this method now and, and nothing happened. And I tried it, really nothing happened. And he expected something more dramatic like flames shooting out of the dock connector or something like that. <laughs> um, it's also sometimes nice to see how Apple did certain things, like this very nice new uh, reload reload control they added on iOS 6. It turns out, like, the core of this is actually a CA Spring animation, which is a new subclass on the basic animation and has, has a few physics parameters, so you can give this thing a weight and a stiffness and a velocity, and this, unfortunately, is private DPI, and I'm dying, and I really hope this gets public on iOS 7. There is actually a jailbreak on the jailbreak store in this idea that moves all your basic animations into spring animations, and the whole system gets completely crazy and wobbly and everything. Yeah, in the end, uh, Apple is not evil. Apple is simply smart, because API is technical depth. I, I see this every day myself. I, I, I'm writing a big framework, and I'm most of the time a little bit too, too quick on giving out the API, and then you change this class, and then you can simply delete the old, the old method. You have to think about it. Imagine if Apple says on iOS 7, oh yeah, all the layout wasn't that great. We're going to remove it. And since it was only there for one version, we simply delete everything, and please do it the old way. Yeah, so they, they would have to deprecate it and think about still making everything work. So every API that they do not publicize, they can move around freely and making the whole system more agile. A good example is this one. Uh, the UI child view controller containment system Apple added in iOS 5. Um, guess how long this is actually there. I looked back down to iOS 2.1. I was too lazy to look out the headers on 2.0, but it was there on 2.1. So it just took him a really long time to figure out that this is something that would be useful for us as well. So, and the, probably the last thing where private API sometimes is okay, if you want to do a certain piece of UI that is simply not possible with public methods, but it's just like makes a great app insanely great. And I have a good example of this. Um, notice, look up the header animation. Actually, a friend at another conference showed me this, and he told me, yeah, you want to replicate that. That's not possible, and this would be awesome to do. And I, I never noticed myself. This is only if you start maps and then enter a route in the car mode, and then you get, really get this nice smooth slide where the navigation bar is kind of like glued to the status bar. And I'm going to show you now how you could replicate that. So the first thing we want to do is we open Hopper. Hopper is a, oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So Hopper is a, is a disassembler. Um, it's, a, it's not cheap, but it's, it is also a very, very hard problem. Uh, and with this, we, can, we are lucky because the Maps application is actually on the simulator. So we can open the Intel build with it. If we go up there. Oh, wait. Um, we have to go read accessible. And there is. Uh, what's happening now is that Hopper loads the binary of the Maps application and 
transforms all the binary stuff into assembly and also back into a kind of C. Uh, and it also looks up all the methods so we can, we can work with that. So what you already see here on the side is every, every method implementation, this is an implementation detail of the runtime, so it's called method impl and then the controller name and then the actual method name. So it's pretty easy for us to search. Um, and since we want to see how they did the navigation by hiding, we start by typing hide. Uh, hide. Yeah, we look for height navigation bar. And here we see a few matches. So the screen is a little small. So the first one is, is the one that has no animation. This is probably not the right one. That one looks more interesting. And here we see that, yeah, we see not enough. We have to scroll back over there. So we, we kind of see that, that it's calling a, a selector on the Chrome View controller, and it calls set bars hidden animated. So this looks interesting. So let's do another search. Set bars hidden. So. Yeah, that looks right. So you probably don't know assembler, and it, it is, it is kind of like very hard to read. So there is an option on Hopper, which, which is called pseudocode, which gives us uh, a representation that is a lot more workable with. It is, it is like the most ugly C you've ever seen. Um, but it's still something that we can read. So interesting parts here are set status bar hidden with animation. Uh, and then, like, then there's a class that looks interesting, which is called UI status bar hide animation parameters, in it with default parameters. Uh, and all the way back there, set animation bar hidden animation parameters. So I know how to show and hide navigation bar, and this is something that is Definitely not in the, in the public API. So the next step, once we know where to look, is we go on GitHub. There is this, there's this nice guy here who did all the work for us and used the runtime browser to uh, upload all the runtime headers since iOS 2.1. It's also very interesting to see the differences internally and what Apple is working and doesn't tell you about. Um, and we can do a search here. And we search for US status bar animation. And we're going to find this class, exactly the one we need, the US status bar animation parameters, and the US status bar hide animation parameters, I guess. So I already pre-opened this, because the internet is a little flaky. Um, this looks interesting. and. This is probably the class we're looking for. So here we have a, a parameter which is called additional slide height. And this is exactly what we want. So the next step is we make a very default Xcode project. This is, this is something very basic. We have a tab recognizer. And on this tab, we show and hide the navigation bar and the status bar at the same time. So when I click here, I get this animation. I'm going to make it slow. Yeah, this is, this is the best we can do with public API, and it's not pretty. I mean, I, I probably, probably could fake it a little bit more with waiting on the, on the navigation part to come in a little later, but you would never get it right. It's, it's simply not possible. We don't know. We don't know the details about the slide. So the next step is, uh, let's close this. Uh, 
I'm going to show you a way how to actually call the new class we found, uh, populate the value, and use this. And before I explain the code, I simply run it. And we get exactly the animation we want. Looks perfect. So, um, don't ship this. <laughs> um, what do I do here? I dynamically get the class, the US status bar height animation parameters. I use Objective C message send to make an instance of this class. Then I use KVO because I could also simply use the selectors, but KVO does all the work for me and is a little bit cleaner to use than calling Objective-C method send. Uh, and then I set the extra height we want. And then, on the last one, I use your application and simply call set status per hidden with animation parameters. And that's it. And down there is simply the logic that I still have to manually show and hide the navigation bar. But that's like something that is very straightforward. So. You could, you could ship this, but this, this will definitely will get rejected. Apple would scan for US status bar height animation parameters, maybe also the init with default parameters, or maybe also the additional slide height. Like, I never, I never ever got rejected for using private API. I don't use it a lot. I mostly do it for fixing Apple's bugs, only in small places and very controlled. And the only time I ever got rejected was with using a method named visible bounds on a class that was completely mine and completely unrelated. Simply, visible bounds seems to be reserved by Apple, and thus I got rejected. I had to rename it into visible bound rect, and then it worked. So this will work, but this, is, this has one problem. If, for example, if, if you would ship this for an enterprise app, uh, you don't have to do ha the hassle with the App Store. You don't have any, any review. And then iOS 7 comes out, and, and the Apple engineers figure that, oh, yeah, we're going to name this additional bar height and not additional slide height. So, and then we run this. Bam, I crash, obviously, because um, KVC would fail. So this is a bad idea. So I'm going to show you the server rind. So this is now the final rind that actually gets passed through the App Store um, and will cope with big changes and will not crash if Apple changes private API and does, does not have this class anymore. Um, there are a few things I want to point out. First, I yeah, it is almost fitting. So I encapsulated everything in a try catch call, which is the first thing you have to do. Then you see all this um, and a string with string. This is the, the simple obfuscation so that it's not detected by Apple. Uh, another good, good thing you should use, you should actually check if the class is actually nil or is, like if, if this is nil, I don't even have to try and I can, I can stop trying the evil thing I do. Um, then I still use KVC, which would simply throw an exception if it fails, which we catch now. And then in the end, um, before I call your application, I get a selector. And you know, the thing about selectors is you can create any selector you want. It, it will not return nil if the selector is not available. It will simply return the selector you create. So there is no point in checking for the selector. You have to use response to selector on, on your application. And if that works, you, I call it. Um, this is actually wrong. This should be one. This should be up there. And only if, if all those checks work out, I set my flag custom animation work to yes. And as soon as something fails, I, I get an exception. I get out. And 
I have a, I have a same fallback, which is simply the, the regular slide. So, down there, nothing changed. Um, if we run this, we get the same as before. And now, let's say we have a typo somewhere, uh, let's say here. And we run this again. And we get a log entry that something is wrong, but nothing is crashing. And it's still an okayish experience for the user. Most of them probably will never even see this. I don't know. Um, yeah. Back to my slides. Um, I showed you how to use the runtime headers, which are very interesting uh, to look through. I showed you how to use Hopper, and I'm not affiliated in any way. You could, you could use ClassDump or OTX or other tools. It's, it's just the one that was the most easy one to do the job. Uh, and with that, I actually want to close my talk. So you were talking about obfuscating uh, using some of the private APIs. What are some of the dirty tricks to how to do that? How would you obfuscate using it so you can, I understood you to say that then you wouldn't be rejected if you obfuscated using some of the private APIs. What are some of the ways you could do that? Uh, I, I did not. Okay, is there some way to hide that you are using private API in a way, I understood you to say that you were talking about how to obfuscate using the private APIs, is that correct? Or maybe I misunderstood you. Yeah. So that Apple won't be able to detect that you're actually using some of the private APIs. Uh, I mean, Apple does not get your source code. So, right. I mean, they, they could use sophisticated methods like ptrace or something else to detect. But then again, they, they're calling this internally as well. So it's, it's very hard to them to detect what is like a legal call and what, what is an illegal call. And they're not getting your source code. So the only way to know is doing like a static analysis. And even with the simple method of obfuscating the UI. I mean, some companies are, are, going, are going way farther and obfuscate the whole string encrypted or only translate it before the call and then, gar and then scramble the memory afterwards. So they really like, we did nothing there. Uh, but, it, but this is really like the simplest possible solution that works. And it's so also just that simple solution is enough, and you've yeah. never had any other problems? I mean, okay. I, I, do not, I do not recommend using this a lot. It, it's not something like, <laughs> it's okay. not cheating or, or get, having shortcuts. It's more like, I chose this example because it was easy to show. Uh, actually, I mostly use it for fixing actual bugs, like things like this page call stuff, or I, ha I have a bug in UM menu controller where when you're in the hierarchy on the iPhone and it has like those back and forth buttons and you set new content, Apple forgot to actually give, go back to page one. So you, you get like in a crazy state and I have to dig deep into the UI, UI um, callout bar and set the M level to zero back again. So I actually fix a problem that they forgot to do. So this is mostly like when you should use this instrument and when you should consider using private API. This is like having this animation is like a very nice to have, but sometimes it's really like I need to fix this or I need to write my own class, which a lot of other problems, or I need to stop doing this feature. Yeah, thanks. Just a beginner's question. The obfuscating relies on the Objective-C runtime. How do you uh, obfuscate or hack uh, core data or any C API? Is it, a, is it possible or? Uh, you can, I mean, w what I did there is simply using the runtime to dynamically get an object. I could, I could be very lazy and simply write a header because I would simply use the header that I actually have on the on the runtime headers. If it's purely an enterprise API, I could just copy that in my project. 
and I could access the class as normal. But this, this would really be, this would get you rejected because you're using the, under, under the hood, you're using the official selectors, which Apple checks for. So I simply create them at runtime, and Apple only checks at compile time, and there the selector does not exist. So this is, this is all. You can, you can create any class or um, any method. I mean, it's different if you would do something like subclassing a private class, but this, this would be even more crazy than what I showed there, so I wouldn't do that. But there, there would be ways you could use like set superclass and change this dynamically. It's, it's always, there's always a way to do things you shouldn't do. So uh, thanks for lunch, Peter. Uh -huh. um, is there, besides warning of the compiler, was there a specific reason why you use Objective-C message sent instead of perform selector? Oh, uh, I, I totally forgot about actually telling you about this. Um. So first of all, you should all use Objective C all dispatch prototypes and set it to zero. This will gonna be in the next iOS and the next in 10.9. This would probably be mandatory. In 10.8, it's still turned off by default. And what this will do is it will cry out loud if you use Objective C message send without a cast because you really, really, really should cast it. Kind of like what I did here. And the thing I use this and not NS invocation is simply because this is like 100 times faster and also more compact than NS invocation. Uh, and if you use perform selector, you get this nasty arc warnings. And if you use Objective-C message send, this is so low level that arc will simply not care at all. Okay. 